All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Herb Smith. I actually listened to him close to maybe 10 years ago on a show that I used to be on and listen to religiously, which was uh, the Visigoth show uh, with uh, Keith Hansen, who is, I think the show is pretty much defunct. The, the shows are still available online. It was really one of the first early podcasts Um, but tonight we're going to talk, I think, about an important subject that's still relevant, which is about the trafficking network that was centered in Mena, Arkansas. And, uh, so we're going to go into detail. We've decided to break it into two hours, so this will be the first hour, and, uh, there's so much information there. So, Herb Smith, are you there? Yes, I am. Nice to meet you, William. Nice to be with you as well. So, (laughs) As a listener to your shows, we've you've talked about 9-11 as well, so I recollect you uh, talking about that and me listening to those, so yeah, I'm delighted that you agreed to the interview. So for people who don't know your background, can you talk a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in the subject of men of Arkansas? Yeah, to just give you about myself, I'm 57 years old, I'm a retired postal worker, so I'm, I'm part of the system too. Um, so when we talk about the Iran Contra affair and MENA or MENA, uh, I was, I was in my twenties during the Iran Contra affair. So that I remember some of these things, but what really kind of woke me up was 9-11, but going into 9-11, I think around, I was a, a Republican way back. And when the 2000 election came around, I was, I wasn't crazy about Bush Jr., I was I didn't know I was actually thinking about voting for Gore and all that and so when the the, Ch- the hang chads thing came up that started it just it kind of stunk to me even that you know at that time it it just something didn't seem right to me and I was already uh, I'd voted for Bush senior twice but the hanging chads just the whole way that went down started kind of reawakening my interest in what was going on and then 9-11 happened. I believed it. And But when you got into the second Gulf War, then I really started thinking, what, what's going on here? Like, you had you had Bush Sr. in Iraq, and now you got Bush Jr. in Iraq? Like, that was that was really getting me going. And then I, in, like, 2004, I stumbled upon a video called the Pentagon Strike video. Did you ever hear of that yes, one? Yes, I think I watched yeah, that, right. like, three times, right. yeah. I watched yeah, pretty much every every nine eleven video three or four times. So, okay, <laughs> the, the well known one. Sorry. Yeah, that's so. That's that's what really got me thinking. So, because I it never even dawned on me that the official theory could be false. But so I saw that, and then I realized I was like, huh, you know, we never did see that any video of that plane hitting the Pentagon. And then what got me too was how they said the um, all the. All the um, they knew right where to go to confiscate any video that would take that would take a pit, you know, take any video of the um, of the Pentagon being struck. So I, I went on for kind of about a couple months. I started looking into it, and in the end, for I kind of got confused after a while. It was all new to me, and so I gave it up for a little while. And a couple months later, I got into it again, and then. I got it. And I, I think when I, I really, I, I, I don't know, you probably from, you know, at one point it was the lack, what got me not only the Pentagon, but the, um, the, how they didn't intercept the plane. And I didn't realize that standard oper- operating procedure should have been to intercept the plane and then Bush's behavior in the classroom. So, and then when I really got it was I, when I, I found a site called um, 9-11 Blimp. Have you, have you ever heard of Dave on Business Show at all? It sounds familiar, yes. Yeah. I feel like so I he, like that. Yeah, he's like a physics major, real smart guy. So when he explained how when you take, when, when you realize the towers didn't just fall or collapse, but they were destroyed, well, that energy had to come from somewhere, and it was just a massive energy deficit. The buildings can't go straight through themselves at, at that kind of speed because that's taking away from the gra- – if at all, that's taking away from the, gravita- the gravitational potential energy. And when I got that, then I knew for sure it was fake. And then I learned about Building 7 
And so when I got it, one of the first things I did was I wrote a letter to the, my paper was the Utica OD, Utica Observer Dispatch. So it was the first letter I'd ever written. And it was kind of a, it was kind of a tepid letter as far as one guy had talked about an insurance, um, the, about um, Elliot, um, talking to Elliot Spitzer about like there was an insurance claim. It's something to do with insurance. And I can't even remember what it was, but I wrote this letter to the local paper and I got the next morning, like I got two calls on it. <laughs> and one guy was like, told me about um, a book, Barbarians in the Gates by Colonel Dom de Grand Prix. Yeah, I recollect that book. Right. So this guy was telling me about, um, about uh, Joseph McCarthy was right, blah, blah, blah. The other, the other phone call I got was by an older lady and she wanted to meet me. And it turned out like she was actually like, a communist <laughs> back that's in the day. Okay. So I got it's so I, I don't know what about my letter that actually spurred her on, but it, it was kind of weird. So I went and met I met, you know, I was I didn't agree with that, but it, it was kind of like I felt like I was kind of underground, you know, and that, that was new for me. And so I wrote more letters, did presentations, and then my friend Andy Senior, who's the other half of the Uticans, like he's a great writer and he had been studying, we go back to high school, and he had been studying 9-11 too. And the, the, the time it happened, his wife told told him the day it happened, said Bush did it. Now, in the mm-hmm. beginning, it didn't take me long to realize it just wasn't a Bush thing. But at first, I kind of thought it was. But, you know, it didn't take me long to get past the right-left paradigm. But so he was, he said, why don't we start a blog page and we'll call it Uticans for 9-11 Truth. And I wasn't really crazy about 9-11 Truth. I don't like to always use the same terminology everyone else does, but I, you know, I agreed to it. I said, okay. He said, you know, we don't have anything better to say, better, anything else to call it. So I said, all right, we'll do that. And so I started writing things. He started writing things up on our blog. And um, we were both listening to like Wing TV and a little bit of Alex Jones um, and when I heard, I think uh, Viz was on Wing TV, and then I found which one was Wing him. TV? Was that the guy Victor Thorne? Victor Thorne, yeah, right. who, who, who died in 2016, who, right? Or supposedly, yeah, around that 2015. It was during the election, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, Did you ever hear of his story? Wasn't he in Pennsylvania or something like that? Didn't yeah, he, he. I think he said, "If I ever get suicided, the Clintons killed me." Right? Didn't he say something? Yeah. Like that? yeah. So yeah, that, right. The minute that happened people were talking about the Clintons doing it. And actually I used, uh, I used his books on Hillary. He had, he had uh, three series, um, three series of books on the Clintons, right. the uh, sex, drugs and murder volumes. Right. So, so he, had, he had done a lot of research on that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I was listening to, I was, it was, it, it stood for a uh, world independent something wing D. I I can't even, will well, a world independent news group or something. Yes, that's right. Well, yeah. That so right. that's how I heard Viz. And then I, I, uh, I started listening to Viz's shows and I remember telling Andy, I said, wow, this guy's a really good interviewer. I, I thought he was one of the better ones. Cause I, I think I'd listened to, he didn't like, it turned out Viz didn't like this guy, Greg Szymanski. Yeah. And I know I was Greg like, Szymanski. Yeah. He, I remember yeah, that. And he, I don't think Viz liked him. And I didn't think he was, he was an okay interviewer, but when I heard Viz, I was like, wow, this guy's really good. So I think what happened is we put a, um, we must've put a link to one of the shows on our site. And then I saw in the comments, he asked us if we wanted to be on the show. And I told Andy, I said, Andy, like this Visigoth, he's, he put a comment here. I think he wants us to be on the show. And that's, that's kind of how that started. And gotcha. so I would still do presentations and sometimes we, we talk about them. So I have to say in the beginning, like I was pretty naive. I thought it's just people just didn't know the stuff. And once they, you know, once they know it, like something's going to happen. <laughs> so that you know, I really did feel that way in the beginning. And I thought, well, if we can do something local, get on shows, do, and then other people, you know, cause I, I didn't think you could necessarily get it nationally, but you could do something local. And if other people did something local, that's the way we can get this out there. And <laughs> Right. It was, I say, it was all new to me and, and I really did believe like I was going to change things I, what did I, and I, I went at it whole hog, you know, right. and, um, and then 
2015, I think it's around Viz got off. And then and not only that, when Victor Thorne, he had some issues too, but um, it's funny when, when I did, so, you know, af, after he got into 9-11, I still see, th- see things through a 9-11 lens, but of course 9-11 led to a whole mess of other things, <laughs> and including Arkansas and the Clintons and the Oklahoma City bombing, the Kennedy assassination, which I wasn't really even that, I wasn't really that into the Kennedy assassination. I, I think I kind of thought he was, I, I kind of thought he was killed by someone other than Oswald, but I didn't really pay that much, you know, I didn't give it too much mind, you know, really a lot of attention. And so I say, it just led to other things. And, and that's how I, I got into the Clintons and, and, you know, you realize, like I said, you realize pretty quick that uh, there's the Republican Democrat thing doesn't matter. And I don't even, I don't even look that this is like, doesn't even factor into my mind now. I, I, I couldn't care less. You know, I don't even think about that. Right. But so that's how it went. And like I say, then we got, so that was going on for quite a while. 2015, not only well, Victor Thorne um, passed away when I, when I ordered one of his books, I was going to be on a, a show because what Bill Clinton was coming into town. So I thought, well, if, you know, Bill, Bill Clinton's coming into Utica I thought, why don't I, I I'm going to see if I can get on a, a local station and talk about him, I'll talk about him and the drug, all the drugs going on in Mina. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's funny. One of the, one of the guys that, um, like the first presentation I did was in local college because it was a friend of Andy's got me on it. And I, I did okay. Not that great. It was my first time. And that guy who put that on, it was part of a whole mess of other things this guy was putting on at the college his, he was like a really lefty guy, but he had, he had all these things going on at the college. And one of them was, he wanted me to do 9-11. So when Clinton came into town, I went on the radio and this guy actually got arrested for going to, a, he spoke at this, uh, I think it was called the Stanley Theater in Utica. And Clinton spoke and this guy called him a war criminal and everything. And he oh, got man. arrested. Oh, he, he had more guts than I did. I went on the radio, he got arrested. Gotcha. <laughs> So, so, so that, that's how I, I had started a bit on, 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 um, Mina. And, uh, then I didn't really get it. The, the guy who had me on his producer, I had done something on nine 11 before and his producer, he was, he was young, but he's kind of an old soul type and he got me back on. So I knew I could ask anytime I wanted to get on the show, I could talk about, about Clinton and Arkansas. And, um, then I also did a show. I didn't really feel like I was able to completely present what I wanted because you know it was it was kind of contentious, which was good. You know you know you don't want to just preach it converted. Um, actually, two of the guys on that were on his show ended up agreeing with me, like the producer and this other guy. And then I also did a show at a local college radio show show on this. And then just recently, what brought this upon was I put up a a link to Billy Jack Haynes, the wrestler, talking about being one of the witnesses to the boys on the tracks and your, your producer, your, your producer booker, he saw that, I guess he must be a wrestling fan. And yes. that's how, you know, that's how we got in contact. Interesting. So I don't, I don't know about that uh, story. I don't even know much about wrestling, but uh, <laughs> he, when did he come forward and say that? Because that um, event happened back in the eighties, right. early eighties, yeah. maybe yeah. that happened in 87, 87. Yeah. He just, he just, uh, Came, I think he said it a few years ago, maybe even 2016, but it, it kind of brought it back a little bit. And even a year ago, he talked about it. And on the wrestling show, Hannibal TV, the guy called a, a private investigator out there just recently and did a show. So it, at least kind of at least kind of brought it back a little. Well, you know, we'll get into that, you know, the next show, but how uh, and see, you know, whether whether he really was a witness, who knows why he would say about. Well, why would he say it if he wasn't, you know, you know I'm not sure, but it, at least it, it kind of brings it back again. And it like to say it is important because some of the, some of the same people, of course, the Clintons, William Barr comes up in this, they're still around. And I think William Faulkner said past history isn't, isn't dead. It's not even past. It's not even past. Right. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So it, it really does. It really shows, it shows it shows where we live is not where we think we live. Everything we've been told about America is just not, not true. 
And yeah, and the boys in the tracks, uh, for people who don't know, were two young men who were out late at night. Uh, they supposedly, the, the cover story was that they smoked marijuana and lied down on the tracks and were run over by a train. But I think it was on a on an independent autopsy showed that they had been stabbed. If I, my memory stabbed, is, and yep, yeah, stabbed, beat up. One was stabbed, and one was stabbed, and had a skull crash, caved in. <laughs> right. So they, it looks like somebody had done that and then laid them on the tracks. And it's just been a story that's been around for decades now, really. I mean, I, one of the authors was Mara Leverett, who wrote, wrote a terrible book about the West Memphis Three, in my opinion. Oh, and, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, Mara Leverett. Yeah. Book on that. Yeah, no, because Merrill Leverett is, yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, it, it, it kind of somewhat ties into that strange Arkansas world, you know. That was West Memphis. Right. Know, so. I was, was going to bring that up to you. To, I didn't realize she wrote something on it because I was wondering if it, I mean, you wrote Abomination and I was wondering, I was in Arkansas and I was wondering if there's any ties to it in some Well, fashion. that's the tie because she's still kind of, right. uh a cheerleader for these three guys who were convicted and were almost done with probation next year. Um, they've never vindicated themselves in a court of law. They're still guilty at law. And she said the most bizarre things in public that you just drop your jaw if you know the case because, um, yeah, and, they're, and they found something in um, Damien Eccles' storage locker. He let it go and didn't pay up for it. Guy bought it and found that he had had an advanced copy of Devil's Knot, his storage <laughs> locker. So it's not, it looked like, by in my opinion, it looked like he was in communication with her before she published the book. Oh. And the guy who bought the um, storage locker said that there was a receipt in there from an attorney, and it looks like the attorney, I haven't seen the receipt, this is all uh, what he told me, but that the attorney actually went through the book to see if there was anything incriminating and make sure that it, well, there was nothing incriminating. So it's not an objective book at all. It's not a third party book. And, uh, it, sorry, sorry. No, but I just, it's just strange to have these weird things. Arkansas is a very strange place. You know, there's a lot of things that went down in little rock. It was the part, I mean, Bill Clinton, if people don't know his parentage is not known. The person who said they said he was his dad is not his dad. Blythe could not have been his dad. Right, he was, he was in he was, he was in Italy. Mm-hmm. Right, and you know, of course, you know, one of the the, the theories is Bill Clinton is really an illegitimate Rockefeller. Right, because they're one of the Rockefellers used to spend time down there. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. I Went to what... Rockefeller, and um, but you know, it, it's funny when you're talking about this. Mora, what is it? Mora Leverett? Is that her name? Mara Leverett, Mara Leverett, okay. M-A-R. Mara Leverett. I mean, that, that seems to be par for the course. You, you see her write a book on the boys on the tracks, and you're like, wow, this this is maybe someone someone saying something. And then they go and they disappoint you with something else. Like, this just seems to be par for the course on these type of things, you know? Dude, <laughs> she left out the, I mean, really important points, which are the 500-page psych record made by two different hospitals one in arkansas and one in oregon about damon eccles who was kind of the ringleader he was 18 year old he, he was older than the other two and they left out the post-conviction confessions of jesse miskelly there's no mention of that in either book i gotta go back and verify the post-conviction confessions but mm-hmm. when you get one you'd get a totally different skew and i, and I think it's unfortunate because yeah it's it's too bad because that movie was option. There was a movie about it. The book was option. Excuse me. There was a movie about it. And so that's what people have is this uh, book of record. And yeah, it's, it's off the charts, man. Yeah. So Arkansas is a strange place. Bill Clinton's a strange person. You know, when George Bush senior died, he was in, here's a picture of him in his hospital room as he's passing away, you know, within the days of his death. Why is Bill Clinton there? Isn't he his political well, adversary? Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, of course, you know, their campaign managers got married when they were running against each other for president. Right. So. Yeah, so, you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, oh boy, well, yeah. I mean, it gets yeah, stranger and, and stranger. And so then Bush is tied up to men, as, tied up to men, as you probably already know as well. Yeah, that's for sure. It, well, I mean, the, the Iran-Contra affair... Um, it was Edwin Meese who coined, I believe, coined the term Iran-Contra. And um, there's a book by Terry Reid who was involved 
in the goings on in Mina, at least as far as the the um, the manufacturing of weapons and training of the pilots. And uh, according to him, oh, I forgot what I was saying. What, what was well, well, it? Was the pilots? Who was the famous pilot? Who was the well-known pilot who was shipping stuff into Mena? What was his name? He ended okay, up getting that was Barry Seal. Barry Seal. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So I forgot where I was going with, with I'm that. Sorry. I, was, I was going to do that at least once. Because there's so many, there's so many, there's so many uh, pay, there's I, all these guys, Dan Lasser, there's all kinds of, you can get into the Arkansas Redevelopment Fund, there's that, all kinds of money laundering, right. <laughs> just yeah. so dirty. So, so basically, yeah, okay, I know. So the Iran-Contra was, was coined by, the phrase was coined by Edwin Meese. And in the book, they talk about William Barr saying, even that, even to call it Iran-Contra was a bit of a diversion, although the Iran-Contra fair is officially considered the diversion of profits from weapon sales to from Iran to weapons to the Contras. Right. That's kind of what it's called. You know, that's the official version of what it is. Um, and William Barr, who's now the attorney general, and he was, he was, uh, he was a, a big part of the Iran Contra fair. His, his code name was Bob Johnson. And even he, he was, Dressing down Clinton in in a, in a thing I'll get to because Clinton was they were taking a little bit too much for themselves doing things, okay. and he said that uh, even call I think he even said this that's a diversion as well to just just to to keep it as Iran Contra is not well, giving the obviously it's not, not seeing the full the broader story. picture right. right I mean there's right. a lot so, more going on right right so maybe they thought okay that. Yeah, let's label it this. This is a limited hangout, right? Right. We let's can, call we it. Can, we can get around this, right? But we don't want to bring up the drugs. We don't want to bring up Arkansas. We don't want to, so. That's so. The Iran Contra is even to call it Iran Contra feels like that's their term and that's they're leading you a certain they're, way already, right? But yeah, right, you know. So yes. but again, the Iran Contra was a diversion to the Contras. And I'm sure your listeners know the Contras were the, uh, the Somoza loyalists who were overthrown by the communist Sandinistas. Right. And that's that's how the whole idea that we can't have communists down in Central America and we have to we have to fund the Sandinistas. We have to fund the Somoza loyalists, the Contras, to get that back in because because we can't be free if we have communists down in Central America. Of course. They're still there, and somehow we're free. So, yeah, how'd that work out? Yeah, it's, it's, I, so if I said we weren't free, and they said, "What are you talking about?" Well, the Sandinistas are still in power, aren't they? But so, anyway, so we, Mina is basically about what happened there was. Uh, so you've got it's hard to which one to start with. For the, probably the easiest they hit, so they had. They had weapons weapons manufacturing going on down there. We'll start with what they did was they they brought a um, the CIA brought a firm called Ivor Johnson, which apparently goes back to the Revolutionary War. Interesting. I've never heard that term. Yeah. <laughs> so no, they, I never yeah, heard they, of they, Ivor Johnson. I, honestly, I didn't. Even know. Yeah. So well, I guess they they got quite a heritage, you know. So they they took them they took they relocated them from New Jersey down to Arkansas, and then they had a, so they were started manufacturing weapons. For the Contras there, and then they had another. I can't. The, the name escapes me. But they had another company that was converting the auto, the um, semi-automatics that Ivor Johnson was making into automatics, and then they were they were doing things without the. Um, we're not putting serial numbers, so they're untraceable. So that what that was one part of it. Obviously, the weapons. The other part of it, and was, and now it's just funny. Now, have you heard of Seth Ward? Seth another Ward. Arkansas. He's another. Ar- okay, he's another Arkansas businessman. That when Terry Reed, who wrote the book Compromise, as part of the uh, Iran Contra, uh, part of the Mina, um, the Mina. Well, he was part of the the piloting and the the manufacturing because he was a, a manufacturing expert. So when he wrote, he was he was part of that. He actually was. He was as a pilot. He had a um, he had a business with Seth Ward in Arkansas. So that's how he got involved in Arkansas because they had a an ultra um, an ultra light plane business. So that's how he got involved with Seth Ward. And then Seth Ward 
ended up, Seth Ward was Webster Hubble's father-in-law. Wow. And Web, okay. Webster Hubble, Webster Hubble was part of the Rose Law Firm. Rose Law Firm, right. So yeah, so they're all going to tie in. So you've, you've had, right. you've had, you've got the weapons with that, which then you've got the, of course, the drugs. <laughs> right. And, and that, I think now, of course, that, that ties in with Barry Seal, who, who was, um, Oh, here's here's a funny thing about Barry Seal. I don't know if, if you know that. You've, have you heard of Daniel Hapsicker? Yes, of course. Uh-huh. Okay. Very well, yeah. well I, I Barry and right the Boys, on, right? Wasn't that his book? Yes. Barry and the Boys? Yeah. Right. And I think it's right on the cover. They have a he's got a, a 1963 photograph in Mexico City of Barry Seal with Frank Sturgis, Felix Rodriguez, who right. was part of the Iran Contra affair, part of the Phoenix Project, part of the Bay of Pigs. He's He's a, a Bush loyalist from way right. back. Was it, was it Felix Rodriguez that killed Che Rovara? Is that right? Yes. 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 And I guess he, I guess he, um, he cut his hands off as well. Yeah, he would still wear Che Guevara's watch on his wrist. You know, so. And they're not sure if he cut his hands off before or after he killed him. Wow. And then um, Porter Goss is also in the picture. Right. And I don't know if Porter Goss. When I first got into nine eleven, Porter Goss was the uh, the head of the CIA at that time. Right. So I knew that name, and it, it turned out. And Porter Goss was also on the um, House Select Committee of Intelligence, and he and he talked about he's also he was also a congressman in Florida, of course. Right. So it just all goes back. It's all interwoven all the way back, right. even that far back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Barry Seal again, he, and even in I guess these guys were these guys were part of um, assassination team called Operation Forty. So. Barry Seal goes way back. So they, he they had their eye on this guy like from the beginning, and he also was a in 1972. He was like TWA's youngest pilot, and he was he was um sm- he was smuggling weapons for the anti Castro Cubans. Right. So, he, so he's he, networked he, with that too. Yeah. Yeah, so he you know, he goes way back. He's obviously like mobbed up like right from the beginning. Now it's funny though they, and I know if you you probably mentioned this on a show I was listening to is how like nothing ever really happens to Cuba. <laughs> you know they they, they can never. I, I think Johnny Carucci's talked like they can never seem to assassinate Castro. Right. Right. You know it just happens to be a Jesuit a Jesuit Catholic country. Yes, very strange, very strange yeah. indeed. That they, I mean, it's he's not very powerful. Nothing next to the U.S. is potency, but uh, yeah, it's very strange. I think something happened because of Kennedy that they people became gun shy after '63. You know, after November twenty second, mm-hmm. I think that that's really what dissuaded. Like, look at what it's come to. And I read a really interesting book about the assassination. I actually had the guy on my show. His name was McPherson. Was the author of a book about. Um, the assassination of Letelier, the first person really assassinated in D.C., and it was all these anti-Castro Cubans who were super violent in those years, 60s and 70s. So these guys are hanging out with these operators who were very angry, who got kicked out of their country, and uh, were violent. Lots of weapons. Yeah. Lots, um, of, lots of illicit means of getting funding as well. Well, one uh, according to Terry Reid, one of the... Um... One of the guys when they were when they're I'll get into that but when they were training the pilots one of the guys that they brought in from Cuba that was training the pilots in a Anella airstrip that was like like ten miles away from Mina uh, he was he was a Cuban exile that that like brought that shot down or brought down a plane in Cuba like and he was one of the guys tra- training the the Contras in, in Arkansas. And there was also now this would be a matter of public record. A guy named Emil Camp was also another guy that was training the training the contra pilots in Arkansas. Well, he like ran out of fuel and like ran into a mountain. And they think this guy that was training the contras, I don't have, you know, he had a code name, I don't know his name, but he's the guy that like killed his, uh, a Cuban flight. So yeah, we're talking about like real real violent people. <laughs> yeah, that they're getting involved with. It's, yeah, it's crazy. no, really crazy, crazy, year, crazy era. I think the guy who I talked to, uh, McPherson, who I think is a professor in North Carolina, he said that the most terrorist actions and actions and bombings were done by 
uh, anti-Castro Cubans in the U.S. Tons yeah, of bombings that, and violence. If you look at the if you look at the Kennedy assassination, the anti-Castro Cubans come up a lot, and I, I think that that um, memo by J. Edgar Hoover about a George Bush coming to the, after the assassination of George of Mr. George Bush from the CIA come to came to ask me about the anti-Castro Cubans. Right, like he already knows about them all, right? Yeah, right. I don't. Know. He just wants to see what Edgar Hoover knows. Yeah, and I think that that might have been Hoover's little blackmail kind of fingering George Bush for for being involved in the Kennedy assassination, possibly. Oh, he wasn't but, at. He wasn't actually in Dallas. He was in Tyler, Texas, which is about fifteen miles from Dallas. Yeah, right. <laughs> Keep me in here. I just a, a friend of mine has a. He works with a guy that as a Kennedy assassination guy, and he asked him, he goes, well, how long have you been studying this? He said, 30 years. He's like, 30 years? And he goes, yeah, it leads to a lot of other things. Right. It's so true. It's not, yeah. it's not that he was slow. It's not that he's stupid. <laughs> it just, it, it really does tie into, it ties into, into a whole bunch of other things. No question. Anyway. And like I was, I was saying about Barry Seal, so Barry Seal, uh, he, it was, it was um, Oliver North, Terry Reed had been in Vietnam and in the secret war in Laos, and he he did some things for the FBI and the, and the CIA a little bit, like with the Toshiba, who were like, he was involved in like um, Toshiba machinery or something that manufacturing that was stealing something from the U.S. and giving it to the KGB. So he had, you know, he had some, he had some, a spy background and he, Oliver North knew him. His his code name was um, Kathy at that time, hmm. John Kathy, I believe. And uh, so Oliver he had Oliver North had been trying to recruit Terry Reed, and when he got into Arkansas with Seth Ward, that's how he got more involved with that. But so Barry Seal, and and then it was it was Oliver North that hooked up Terry Reed with Barry Seal. So in gotcha. Barry Seal was, of course, Frank Sturgis, uh, part part of the Kennedy assassination. I'm not a huge Kennedy guy. I don't know all the details, but I know there was a lot going on with Oswald and New Orleans. And, of course, Barry Seal is from Louisiana. Right. So he's in that area. Oh, yeah, it kind of ties in. So like I, um, like I was saying, Barry Seal definitely goes deep. And so he – According to what I'm reading, he wanted to get th- things started in Louisiana, but he ended up going to Mena in like 1982. And Mena was like Mena was like the right spot because it was it was out of the way, it, it was very rural, especially where where Mena was uh, up in the mountains. It was a very difficult area to get to. It was a small town. It was very rural and rural, and you had. Clinton, who was like the perfect guy, uh, Terry Reed, what the, what they call what they call Arkansas is a banana republic. Right, it's kind so, of a one. It was a one party state there, right? I mean, back in the mm-hmm. day, Democratic controlled. Clint, right? It was really controlled by I guess a guy named Jackson Stevens was like the kingmaker down there. Gotcha, and he was kind so, of a financial guy yes, with tons of money. He's, yeah. he's kind of like he's kind of like the Rockefeller, I think, of Arkansas. Right, I remember that. Oil, yeah. utilities, banking. I guess he's got the biggest investment firm west of Wall Street. So, do you know? Do you know who cool. else came out of Arkansas at that time, supposedly in oil? Jerry who's Jones. That? You know who Jerry who? Jones is? No, I'm not sure who yeah, that is. Jerry one is. Jones owns the Cowboys. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, Jerry. No, he guy, came yeah. right out of Jackson <laughs> State. That whole era, right around Clinton, somehow had tons of money enough to buy a. Uh, a sports team in Dallas, pretty wow. pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, you, you can't. You just keep just the rabbit hole. It never yeah. stops. Oh, you start yeah. researching this. You yeah. never See run where out that of money things. comes from. You know, yeah. You got to launder that cash. You got to put it somewhere. Yeah. So, um, Arkansas was like the perfect state. It was its own little banana republic. Clinton had all he he had pretty much. He got the people he wanted in in the in the as far as the judges. He had his he had his dirty cops. He he they they pretty much owned that 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 state, and it was it was just a it was a you know it was very it was a it was third world. It's a very poor area. 
it's 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 mountain in the terrain when they were pi- training the pilots the terrain was very similar to Nicaragua so it was it was it was just it was just the, and then you yeah you had Jackson Stevens you had D- Dan Lasseter you had and then they they started the ADFA the Arkansas Development Finance Authority specifically to launder money from the from the CIA because they couldn't they couldn't pay these they the people that were making the weapons they couldn't pay them it was illegal under the Bolin amendment it was you, you couldn't finance the, the whole reason was illegal because they, they made it illegal to finance the contras so obviously they they couldn't pay them <laughs> but so what they did was they started that ADFA and and they were also laundering a lot of money through Dan Lasseter who was also a bond broker and Worth and Bank and First Bank of Mina which were which were owned by um Jackson Stevens so you you couldn't like you know, they couldn't pay these, they couldn't pay like Ivers Johnson outright. So what they did is they gave loans to the companies they had to pay through the bond fund. Right. That's right. So that in other words, it was all. So that was the laundering that, device to do all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Between, between Dan Lasseter and the ADFA and like I said, Worth and Bank, First Mina Bank, you can launder. I, they had the people, oh, Jackson Stevens also apparently Help bring the BCCI into the United States. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Well, Bank of yeah. Commerce and Credit International, the most the corrupt bank, bank in human history. And, yeah. The banks of crooks and criminals international. Right. So, so everything everything was in place in Arkansas. It was a, it was a banana republic, it, but it had people with the with the banks and the bond expertise to launder the money. Yeah, and, and, so, and Clinton, before he was governor, he was the attorney general, right? Attorney general, yes. Yeah, like 26, 28. Mm-hmm. And then, then, according to Victor Thorne, when he became governor, he 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 got a little bit too for after his first term, he was voted out by uh, Frank White, I believe. Yeah, and really they say they he might have really won that election, but they took it from him because – he was getting a little too big for his britches, according to them, and and they had to. He wasn't the king. He you know, he was just you know he was the puppet. But I think he thought he was a little bit more than he was, and they had to they had to bring him in line. And then he then he won the next term. But I see. so he and um, Tyson Chicken uh, Don Tyson of Tyson Chickens is another big name down there. Right. Yeah. And one of his associates. Of course, Hillary made her money that big, that thousand dollars into a hundred thousand dollars in commodities. Right, wasn't it like a cattle futures or something like that? Yeah. yeah. So that ties in with Tyson chickens. <laughs> wow. So, so all all these things, if you just think of of Arkansas as a banana republic, and the CIA is like as Terry recalled, renting was renting Arkansas. That's that's why so much of it, like you say before, when we were talking before. Arkansas wasn't the only place, but it was probably where most most of most of it for a few years was going on, especially the drugs with Barry Seal and possibly even Tyson, Tyson Don Tyson as well. Um, so there, there was a, a lot going on with Barry Seal, and what happens? Barry Seal got now a lot of people think that the you know, they always talk about the government, like it's just the government, but there's all, there's various departments of the government. So what one hand, they don't tell everybody that Barry Seal is doing these things for us till it comes up. And so Barry Seal got arrested by, I, I think in, in Miami by the DEA there. But what they did in 84 was when he got arrested, then that they became, they made him an, a DEA informant. So Seal was a so, DEA informant? Yes, I they made him that. in 1984. So once they made him a DEA informant, because people in Arkansas knew there were drug drops going on. They knew there were things going on. But once they made him informant, they said he's working for the DEA, so they couldn't pursue it as well as, as they wanted to. You know, they would just say, hands off, he's our boy now. So I, I think that was once he got arrested, that was their, that was their way of protecting him. From from anything else, because no one now they, they didn't go tell everybody at first that that he was working for the CIA and that he was doing things down in Mina and 
until people started making a fuss. And then, like say, the, I don't think the government is all, they don't tell everybody everything. It's not one one organization. It's all, it's a conglomerate. So if the DEA in Florida doesn't know what's going on and they arrest him, but they don't want to make blow his cover for what was going on in MENA, then they made him an informant. So it was kind of, then it became hands off on Barry Seal because they, they they knew what was going on down there, but they they couldn't get to him because they know him once he became a DEA informant, and then what he did was he he was taking drugs down and taking drugs back, but then he he spied on the Sandinistas. He got drugs from the Sandinistas, and what happened was he's got pictures. I don't I don't know if Barry Seal was in the pictures, but he took the pictures and Reagan wanting to get get support saying, oh, the Sandinistas are stooped to anything. You know, he, he's got the Sandinistas like transporting drugs into his plane on his pictures. And Reagan went and, and exposed, you know, put that up on TV and exposed. And then he just blew Barry Seal's cover. Interesting, right? Yeah. So that made him <laughs> now. Now he's becoming a liability, but he's still. So now when he blew his when he blew his cover, and I'm not sure what year he did that, but so it made it made Barry Seal expendable, and that, that could have been part of the the whole thing. And then he he got arrested again from Louis like from Louisiana, and then he went. Um, what he did, he thought he was going to get out of that one, but what they did was the judge from Louisiana ordered him to stay from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. in a halfway house in in Louisiana in a, a halfway house with the Salvation Army. Now, when Reagan exposed his cover, as far as the, the Sandinistas, the Medellin cartel put a $500,000 purse on his head. So what, what this judge did is he told he made, there was known where Barry Seal was going to be. Right. So he so, basically signaled it, right? Right. And so his lawyer said, well, you just, you just put a death sentence on him. And of course that's what happened. Right. So then all these supposed guys from South America came in and shot him, right? Right. Now, according to, there's a book called the, the conspirators by L Martin. It's of uh, the conspirators, uh, secrets of an Iran Contra insider. And he, what well, he, L. Martin was more involved in the financial end. According to him, the, the Iran Contra wasn't just, a, you know, not just even just about drugs. And they, it was it was I, it was tied up with all this fraud and all these shell corporations and all this sort of thing. Well, according to L. Martin, the, the guys that shot Barry Seal were involved, were were employees of Southern Air Transport, which was a CIA front company. Yeah, it's always been, yeah. It's like a notorious. Right, right. Record. Okay, so you know, so yeah. he said there was their, their record was scrubbed, but according to Al Martin, you know, he had some information on it, and that's really where these guys came from. In other words, it wasn't just the it really wasn't the Medellin cartel that that killed him. <laughs> and Al Martin says that William Casey gave gave the word to liquidate Barry Seal. Interesting. And also, according to Terry Reed, Barry Seal was blackmailing Bush, <laughs> which was, uh, he, had, he, they, he, he, apparently he got some pictures from the KGB, but Barry, Barry Seal used a lot, he blackmailed a lot of people, including Edwin Meese, with dirty money so it could be traced. But Barry Seal told Terry Reed that he had something on Bush's sons as far as getting involved in the drug trade. So Barry Seal was a dead man. No, no matter how you know that, no right. matter how you look at it, the guy he got in a little bit over his head, and I think he thought he could do because he could do better than he did it. Barry Seal always thought he could handle the handlers, and it turned out not to be true. I mean, didn't right. he have tons of money? He was trying to always invest his money, right? I thought that there was always he always had problems like trying to figure out where to put his cash. Oh yeah, yeah, I think that that's in the. Um, did you see American Made with Tom Cruise? Yeah, I don't remember it very well. Yeah, but I definitely... part of that he was he you know and and I'm granted it's Hollywood, but he was having trouble with all the money he had. He he had um he had 
Lon, he was drop doing drop offs. A lot of it was going to Dan Lasseter to lawn to launder for him. And if anybody doesn't, Dan Lasseter was a, another bond broker, and he was really good friends with Bill Clinton. And Roger Clinton was his chauffeur. And when Roger Clinton got busted, Dan Lasseter got busted as well for cocaine and cocaine being a cocaine dealer. And he was given three years, but he only served six months. And two of those months were under house arrest, and he got pardoned by Clinton. Wow. So. Dan Lasseter was another, they call them bond daddies. Dan, Dan Lasseter was, again, another part of the, the whole money laundering scheme. Yeah, the lesser known kind of operator, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 was, I was doing some research on him, and he started getting his money. Do you remember um, the Ponderosa Steakhouses? No, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. They were pretty big up here when I when I first, I'm like kind of like a weird fussy eater. <laughs> But when I first started, eat, so when I first started eating steak, I used to go to Ponderosa Steakhouses. Well, Dan Lasseter started the Ponderosa Steakhouses. I guess that's that's how he started making his money, and then he got more into bonds and and that sort of thing. But yeah, so like everybody, Clinton was hanging around <laughs> his brother Lasseter, like doing a lot of drugs. I mean, it just it just seems to be around there a lot. Yeah. Well, that was the era. I mean, I think that was really a cocaine era. I don't know, maybe the seventies into the eighties. That was. They don't think they knew the consequences as much. Right. I, I think when when I start getting to nine eleven, and I I under when I really understood it intellectually as far as the the physics of the towers and all that, I got it. But I think I think when I realized because I, I grew up in the I was in my twenties in the race in the Reagan area and I know all the just say no. And when I realized as I got a little bit older, okay, I, I knew people did drugs. Like I never did them, but I knew people that did them and I knew they didn't have any problem getting them. <laughs> like, so when I realized the drug war was phony, right. And then it, that just, that just really hit me. And I was like, Oh my God, what else is fake then? Like they made such a big deal about that. And then it turns out, that they're dealing drugs, and I was that was that was the one I think that, and that's why I I gravitate towards this because there's there's so much, especially with the money laundering, like they they can't they they the CIA and drugs go way back, and I think to me more than anything, the hypocrisy on that just blew me away at first. Yeah, it's <laughs> and, incredible hypocrisy because these it, guys all a lot of those guys knew what was going on, and they're making tons of money. Tons of untraceable cash. Mm-hmm. And but it's the it's the money laundering where I think you can always get these guys. And also in another part of Mina is people knew what was going on. And there was a there was a an agent named William Duncan. He was an IRS agent. And at the same time, there was a an Arkansas State investigator named Russell Welch. They they ended up coming together because they were Russell Welch was was on the ground hearing things about drugs going on and that sort of thing. And William Duncan found through the ADFA, he found all the money laundering that was going on through there. Oh, interesting. So they got together and I think in 86, they, they went to the, they went to the, they first, they tried to go through the, get a, a federal grand jury to, they, they had um, like a 3000 page report that they compiled with indictments and, and all and um, bankers, witnesses saying they saw money laundering. They, they would see people, people like making deposits at all different tellers at the same time. <laughs> so they did all, all sorts of things. Oh, they, they, they knew this was going on. And what happened was they stymied the investigations at the federal and the state level. So a, um, they got, you know, William Barr, uh, Terry Reed quotes when when they had this thing. What happened was Clinton was taking too much, <laughs> and William Barr had to dress him down. Clinton wasn't supposed to be at this meeting, but he showed up, and William Barr kind of dressed him down for taking for taking a little bit more than they should have because the state was supposed to. It, it's 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 the feds, it's the feds. Um, it's the Iran Contra affair. It's the feds are doing this and they're allowing the state is allowing to do them. They're getting money for it, but they're taking too much. But according to William Barr, um, that they knew about Duncan 
doing all the stuff. And so he said that what they did is they had to get a guy in place, and his name was was um, let me think. I gotta think. Michael Michael Fitz something, and I, I knew oh. I had it. And Michael Michael Fitz you. So he was the attorney that William Duncan presented his evidence to. And Fitz, Fitzhugh said that William Duncan asked for more time. And William Duncan's on a, a, a video called The Mina Connection. And he categorically denies. He said, why would I want more time? Like, I had this ready to go. I want to present this evidence. Why can't I do it? So this Fitzhugh was the guy that, that William that William Barr put into place to stymie the investigation at the federal level. And it took them two years later, they couldn't get it through. So what happened is Duncan and Welch, then they tried it at the state level. So Mina was in Polk County. So they went to the Polk County uh, deputy deputy prosecutor. His name was Charles Black. And they, they presented the evidence to him. So they went, they went to Clinton out Clinton on the state level, they went to Clinton, and of course, the federal level, you got Bush, who's, it was really, the Iran Cantor affair is more Bush than it ever was Reagan, so they, they got their guy, they got their U.S. attorney in place to stop it at the federal level, and then Clinton stopped it at the state level, so Charles, this guy named Charles Black said, we can't, we don't have enough money in our county to prosecute what's going, you know, to look into MENA, so Clinton apparently, uh, he um, promised him twenty five thousand dollars, which he never got. <laughs> and then they, so they also had a uh, U.S. the the Arkansas Attorney General. His name is uh, Asa Hutchinson. Yes, and he became governor later, if I remember yes, correctly. Yeah, he is it right now, I believe. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, I think he's like on his second term. So, so they went out. So. Russell Welch and William Duncan tried it on the state level. They had this 3,000 3, pages of files, and Asa Hutchinson said, Asa Hutchinson said there's nothing, there's not enough evidence here. <laughs> so oh, they stymied it on that level, and the, uh, the Arkansas citizens started an Arkansas committee because they knew of all these. These people lived it. They saw all these low-flying planes and these drug drops and all. They, people knew what was going on. They formed a committee and they went to Clinton and Clinton did nothing again for them as well. So you, you, you had it just, you had it locked up <laughs> and well, you know, but again, Arkan, Arkansinians or whatever, they seem to have forgotten about what all these things Asa Hutchinson, Asa Hutchinson did and, and they voted him as governor twice now, I believe. But the amount of money, I mean, people were speculating the amount of money that was coming through through that trade wasn't in the millions, it was in the billions. It was in the billions, yeah. yeah. Up to, you know, three to five billion, three to five billion dollars worth of cocaine was going in there. Just incredible it was, stuff. It's it insane. And so, yeah, you couldn't hide all that stuff. Not only could you, the logistics of people had to come in and drop these oh, drugs. It was like a military operation that had to involve t- hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, if not thousands, right? Of all different types. You've got the operators, right, right. movers, flyers, drivers, distributors, mm-hmm. yeah. bankers, lawyers, politicians, everybody's in on it. Everybody, yeah, and they, they, a lot of them may not have a choice, frankly. If you want to survive there, take a little money. It's like the old thing, plomo or plata, right? Silver or mm-hmm. silver lead. Anyway, we are at 55 minutes, okay. Herb. Um, do you want to lay a little bit of a groundwork for what you want to talk with about uh, MENA on our next show? A little. Yeah, like you mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about Kevin Ives and Don Henry, who are known as the boys on the tracks that were at the wrong place at the wrong time and ran into a, a drug drop. That was, that was in 1987. Now, Bear Seal was, was murdered in 1986, so in other words, this was still going on. Um, even documents show that even up to at least at least up to 91, the operations were still going on. Now, one thing I, I didn't mention was the the weapons manufacturing that was called um, Center Rose was the was the code name for that, and Jada Bridge was the was the pilot training. That the pilot training had been dropped, but the the weapons manufacturing actually went to Mexico. 
And that, that was the meeting with Clinton. He wasn't too happy about that because he was losing money. But their weapons manufacturer went to, went to Mexico. But it appears that even though, even though that went to Mexico and SEAL was murdered, the drug shipment still went on. Apparently, even, till, even, even at least up till 91, it was still going on. Anyway, so during the drug drop, the the what the boys on the tracks they were murdered, and which you know definitely murdered like you mentioned, and there were also other Mina related deaths as well. So we'll talk about oh, that, and, and what's brought this in the news a little bit, at least at least on the internet a little bit, is a wrestler named Billy Jack Haynes who came forward years a few years ago and said he was he was there when those boys got murdered. So we'll talk so we about cover that. Cover that as yeah. well. Cool. So we'll cover yeah. the boys on the tracks. Billy J. Billy Haynes. Billy, you said Billy Jack, Haynes, Billy Jack Haynes. And there, there's also there's also other people that got murdered in relation to the boys getting murdered as well. Right. And there was a lot of strange deaths around there too. A lot of like uh, state mm-hmm. troopers and people who knew too much. People who spoke out. There's uh, it was very dark. So anyway, we can cover that again. It's Herb Smith. And we just covered kind of an introduction into the MENA drug trafficking operation. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, cool.